Okay, so I think we are ready to start. Um, well, just uh, so for the people sitting in the first four rows, uh, I've been asked to tell you to be careful not to like remove any of these uh, little signs here or displace the cache because tomorrow morning there is some other event starting early and they've set it all up. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly this that is not for you oh, okay so having said this uh, it's a pleasure to have uh, Juna Kron today from Durham uh, and you will she'll talk about a new proposal for phase transition phenomenology yeah thanks for having me it's uh it's my first in-person talk in a little while I guess that was true for a lot of you uh, I've forgotten how awkward I am with the microphone and everything so I hope it all goes well um, but yeah, I'm going to talk about work that I find that I'm excited about, but that's also still kind of in like um, its infancy. Uh, we finished some bits, but we're working on lots of other uh, some other lots of other uh, avenues. And uh, but I'm really excited about it, and I think it's a a good fresh new look at false vacuum decay. So I'll tell you about that. Um, I think this audience doesn't really need too much of an introduction. I don't need to tell you that there's lots of questions uh, we, we have about the very early universe and also that it's very hard to probe the very early universe. We've already come up with uh, many good ways to probe the very early universe, uh, even while we're working with, um, you know, not too much information, but we're working with this mostly photons. And as you know, photons are uh, from, the, uh, from a, a later period. Any source of photons in the very early universe, in, this, in particular in this very first second, would have immediately been like, uh, these photons would have been immediately been reabsorbed in the thermal plasma and uh, any information would be lost. Now, uh, the really great opportunity of gravitational waves is that uh, gravitational waves are not thermally and not like coupled to the rest of the early universe plasma. And so the source of gravitational waves in the very early universe uh, would still would just directly travel to us and to be detected by us and uh, to give so our first direct probe of this uh, this first second. So that's very nice, but uh, for that to you know for to learn about uh, gravitational waves uh, from the very very early universe, we first need, need a source, of course, and we also need to understand that source very well, and that's what this talk is about. So um, the source that I'm going to talk about is a first order sort of phase transition. And uh, again, I don't think that needs too much introduction uh, either, but I'm just going to talk about it, uh, the sort of the three sort of major steps, just in case, uh, you know, a review is helpful. So um, the types of phase transitions that we typically study are uh, can be sort of expressed in terms of a potential energy of some scalar order parameter. And uh, in the very early universe, there was a thermal plasma, of course, and that thermal plasma influenced this theory in such a way if you uh, want to study a first order phase transition, then there's a potential energy curve and at high temperatures, it has this minimum here uh, and at lower temperatures, uh, as you cool down, there's this other minimum. So it's a sort of a, it can be associated with tree breaking, uh, but at least uh, some order parameter changes and a first order phase transition uh, that, that changes in such a way that there is this kind of potential energy barrier at the moment where these two vacua are degenerate. And so the name of the game is really studying the false vacuum decay from this vacuum to this vacuum or a thermal fluctuation over this barrier, but it's not a smooth process. Uh, what instead happens is that like at this kind of a, a probability of false vacuum decay and it's associated with the uh, bubble nucleation rates. If you uh, nucleate a critical bubble, what happens then uh, you want to be in the in the uh, new uh, vacuum because there's, that's uh, energetically preferred and so these bubbles start to expand and interact and uh, interaction between these bubbles and also interaction between the plasma that the bubbles couple to so acoustic waves in the plasma uh, mainly they uh, these, these interactions source gravitational waves and so um, typically we study that using these uh, large simulations in which uh, you actually take a very small set of parameters in which you can express your theory any kind of microscopic like fundamental theory can be expressed in this type of picture in a small set of thermal parameters and you can study uh, the dynamics of the phase transitions in a simulation uh, given these thermal parameters um, now what does that typically look like well um, this is just kind of a heuristic picture for you just to sort of have an idea what we're sensitive to so this parameter that we typically use as cosmologists studying uh, gravitational waves is this omega gravitational wave parameter. It's not necessarily too intuitive. This is 
if you integrate it, you get the, the, the omega, the uh, density over the critical density, uh, energy density over critical energy, energy density stored in gravitational waves. But this is kind of a, a fractional as a, as a fraction of uh, frequency. And so this is uh, kind of has a direct relation to uh, a strain, uh, a strain uh, uh, gravitational wave strain curve too. So um, all I wanted to say is that um, typically for a first order phase transition, you get different contributions to a gravitational wave spectrum. They either come from the energy that's stored in bubble walls, because still bubble walls, like the latent heat released in the phase transition needs to go either in accelerating these bubble walls until they meet, they meet or the plasma, the early universe plasma, uh, may sort of due to friction, due to interaction with the bu these bubble walls, uh, absorb some of that latent heat. And so uh, what the sort of uh, dominant contribution is, is kind of currently under, under debate, but uh, they will all look a bit like this. And in particular, they will all have a kind of a broken power law type form with a, uh, a peak, which relates to the radius of the bubble as it was nucleated. So because of redshifting, you can directly, if you will, relate the peak frequency of such a spectrum to the era in which uh, the gravitational wave was sourced. And so that's what this look, looks like. Uh, I've made some assumptions, obviously, but uh, they're not such super big assumptions. And typically you can kind of translate between this timeline for the early universe and uh, the temperature that a plasma would have had given, I think here what I've assumed is the standard model, degrees of freedom and radiation domination and then uh, map that to a, uh, a peak frequency of the gravitational wave spectrum. And so that tells you that if you then sort of think about the, the uh, frequency windows that experiments have uh, access to, you know, space-based uh, interferometers like uh, LISA will have access to, you know, roughly this, uh, this electroweak era and, uh, you know, particle physics around the electroweak scale, ground-based interferometers and atom interferometers are slightly above that. So in principle, a very large opportunity. And uh, that's also the reason why I think I and, and many others here in the room and many others around the world uh, have been studying, you know, model, like model building and studying phase transitions that we could potentially have access to. But to actually do phenomenological calculations, uh, you need to you have a kind of some control over this calculation. And there's a, there's a few things that uh, need to be improved or understood a little bit better. And so I've kind of put some key challenges here on this slide for each of these three steps that I identified. Uh, so in particular, um, what I find for very kind of fascinating is that um, here it is, this last step modeling, you know, this like modeling the onset of turbulence. So actually uh, simulating a relativistic plasma in a Hubble volume, because you don't want boundary effects, uh, but also modeling the onset of turbulence, which is uh, often a small scale phenomenon, is actually very difficult, as I'm sure you can imagine. And so I am not at all surprised that this step is, uh, is challenging and that you know, this uh, is something that we still need to get better at. Um, so there's, here is a challenge in this step that uh, like about sort of calculating the terminal wall velocity. So if you assume there is, uh, you know, if, if there is kind interaction between the scalar field and the, uh, pl the thermal plasma, then that of course uh, means that the uh, latent heat is transferred to the plasma, but also that the um, walls slow down. And so the terminal velocity is, is related to how much energy is in which uh, gravitational wave component at the end of the day. But the one that I find very, very surprising is that uh, this sort of very first step, which is actually a microphysics step, a first principle step, if you will, which I would have naively thought would be completely under control, is actually not completely under control, and definitely not the uh, smallest source of error in this type of calculation. It might even be the biggest one. And so that's actually what I'm going to talk about. Um, so uh, this is a plot that I'm going to just show you. It's just kind of the result of a very long paper and a very like long analysis. It took us me and collaborators uh, several years to do this. Uh, I always get uh, quite a lot of uh, questions about this slide, but I'm going to defer you to the end because I'm going to first talk about, I'm going to, I'm going to take this under the loop. Don't worry. But what is this? So um, I think collaborators and I did uh, realize that, you know, the, this calculation is not super robust. So what we did is a systematic analysis of all the different sources of uh, theoretical uncertainty, just calculating the Vos vacuum decay rate, and then what type of effect they would have on the gravitational wave spectrum. So this is a summary plot that we produced 
uh, you know, at the very end of this very long paper. Here on this like uh, y-axis, you see the relative uncertainty in the gravitation wave spectrum. What is that? It's the kind of the difference between the largest spectrum predicted and the smallest spectrum, uh, spectrum predicted divided by the smallest spectrum pred predicted as a function of here, the mass scale of new physics. So we did this in a toy model. The toy model was just the standard model Lagrangian plus this dimension six operator. Uh, we know this is not like, uh, we know that this, uh, you know, this is not like a, a complete model and not something uh, you know that you study in isolation, but uh, it does actually map onto quite a lot of models of like electric phase transition uh, uh, physics. And uh, what you see here is that like the error, and we did this calculation in two different ways, but the error is actually really, really quite large. Here, this is like uh, order hundred, and so uh, yeah, you actually. This is kind of awkward. So like this is really not at all at the level of a precision uh, calculation. And uh, this is kind of a summary table, exactly what you see in this plot here. These are the two approaches that we, we, uh, we compared. And you see that like this for the approach, this is the kind of uh, most standard thing that you see in the literature where you calculate uh, thermal, like you calculate the uh, Matsubara modes of like uh, uh, the thermal and the thermal corrections to um, a potential in the 4D uh, yeah, in a 40 of a 40 theory, and uh, this is kind of like a, uh, comparing these sources of error, and you see especially this like dependence on an RGE scale that you uh, that you choose is very large. This 3D approach is slightly different. I don't have time to really sort of explain what this is about, but it's a 3D effective theory where you integrate out modes at different scales set by the temperature, and you do a bit better in that. Uh, you do quite a lot better actually in this approach, but you still don't do super well. And so in particular, the RG scale dependence is uh, a bit awkward. Now that's a, that's a, in the standard model, which is a, a, especially the sector that we're studying, it's a perturbative theory. And so the phase transition is a, about the breaking of a gauge symmetry. And in principle, you know, there's a, an, a, a, a small coupling that you can expand on and uh, that should be okay. In strongly coupled theories, of course, things are even harder. If you want to study um, the breaking of a global symmetry, for example, due to um, a gauge coupling becoming strongly coupled, so confinement, for example, um, then that's actually even harder to study. And so we can't even really use this type of uh, formalism. There's other things that have been proposed. And I've also done calculations uh, in a linear sigma model in particular, uh, but these are of course not actually, you know, these are effective theories that break down, especially exactly at the uh, skills that you're interested in. And so these are inconsistent and also, you know, not to be trusted. So this is, this is a difficult problem um, to have some theoretical control over. And uh, so just what I wanted to do is like have a little look under the hood, what's going on and point out some interesting things that I at least didn't realize uh, a year and a half ago and I've learned th from uh, and like, actually I feel like I understood, uh, I understand field theory a little bit uh, better as a result. So what's the standard thing that you do? The standard thing that you do is you calculate a bounce and the bounce uh, method that's developed by uh, Kalan and Coleman, you know, a, a long time ago, and essentially what it is is just a saddle point approximation. So you, uh, what you need to uh, work out is this false vacuum decay rate. So it's a sort of expressed as like, uh, you know, the imaginary part of the of the uh, of this uh, energy. So like what you can uh, the Euclidean energy. So it's kind of this like path integral that you have here, and uh, you have this like. Uh, you know, false vacuum to false vacuum on path integral with here this uh, Euclidean uh, 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 action in the exponential. And so the saddle point of approximation, what you do is like, you assume that the path integral is dominated by bound solutions. And so you can uh, expand, if you will, around the, these bounces. And so your scalar, uh, so your scalar field, you expand around the bounces and fluctuations around them. And then because you, uh, these, uh, bounces are solutions to the Euclidean equation of motion, the linear term vanishes. And if you then sort of terminate at the second order, this is what you end up with. And this is a thing that you can of course integrate because this is a Gaussian integral. And so all you have left then to calculate this uh, false vacuum decay rate is to calculate this, uh, this object and uh, where you find these, um, these uh, theta bar or phi bars 
from by solving the Euclidean equations of motion. And these are the bounds equations of motion. And if you've ever done a calculation with, uh, you know, a first order phase transition, you've probably solved those. Um, and that's a that's a very interesting and good method. The only thing is just that the assumption here is that uh, these bounds uh, these bound solutions exist. And what's more, these bound solutions uh, exist at tree level. Because what I want to do is I, I want to calculate fluctuations around the bounds background. And if they don't exist at, at tree level, then uh, it's kind of difficult. I don't know what to do. So if radiative corrections cause the phase transition, then you're actually in a catch-22 because what you want to do is a loop expansion around the bounds, but you want, that you want to do that to find the effective potential to find the bounds. And so it's kind of difficult to know where to start. Um, so uh, there's another thing which is kind of related, and that's that uh, the effective action is actually by definition a convex function of the field. So it's defined as the Legendre transform as a generating, the generating functional. And uh, that's only well defined if it's convex. And uh, that's kind of related to an interpretation of the effective action or uh, effective potential. And uh, so this is actually something that I, uh, just from a chapter of like, a, you know, an intro to QFT book that I had always ignored, but it's really there. And um, so sort of the, the, the uh, interpretation actually was given by uh, Weinberg and Wu, Eric Weinberg and, and Wu. And um, what you sort of, uh, what you uh, have here is like, a tree level potential with a global minimum and a local minimum. And then in between there, this barrier, but these uh, modes here related to these uh, field expectation values here in the middle, they are actually unstable. And you will also see that if you do calculate uh, a loop expansion around this potential, you typically end up with an imaginary part here. Um, now, the true vacuum energy of the states here in this uh, pink area here, like phi two, uh, for example, is uh, given by this Maxwell interpolation, Maxwell construction between these vacua. And why is that? It is because uh, the interpretation of the effective potential is actually uh, not sort of given by, you know, the energy of these pure states, but it is uh, given by the energy, like the states with, which, with field expectation value of a particular value. So for example, field expectation value here, what the minimum energy that such states could have uh, would be given the form of the potential. And the minimum energy is of course, some superposition of a state here and a state here. And that's what, what gives you this Maxwell, uh, this Maxwell construction. And so like, I never said that I wanted it to be local in field space and therefore the actual true thing, the true, uh, you know, all orders, if you will, calculation of the effective potential gives you such a convex function. Um, and, you, and I'll show you la a plot later to prove to you that that's actually the case. Um, so um, an ad hoc practical solution, which is often used, is to um, do a, a, you know, for, the, for example, a one loop calculation of the effective potential and uh, kind of uh, integrating out all fluctuations and find a one loop but then you promote again this field to some sort of space-time uh, dependent thing and uh, solve the equation of motion like this. And so you can get something that's not necessarily convex, but uh, it's not really clear if you what you're double counting if you do this. Uh, another thing that you can do that is actually more self-consistent and the 3D thing that I showed you earlier relates to this, it's kind of a variation to this, is like you can compute an effective action, but you do a kind of a uh, a momentum expansion, you integrate out high momentum modes and you find the, the bound solution for the low momentum modes. And so you, you find something that doesn't need to be convex uh, and you're, this is fully consistent. You're not double counting. Uh, uh, well, if you're careful, you're not double counting. So effectively that's a derivative expansion. So that's really good, but you're still, you are still relying on a hierarchy of scales existing and uh, perturbativity. And so, um, what we thought some time ago, uh, myself, uh, Eleanor Hall at Berkeley, she's a brilliant grad, stu uh, grad student at Bil uh, Berkeley and Hitoshi Moriyama is, um, you know, isn't it like uh, funny that actually what we're interested in is locality and field space. We're interested in these, um, you know, field space, which is local, but which the one loop potential does for you, but the all order potential does not because of this convexity issue. And so uh, is there a way to impose that directly? So if we assume that the action is dominated by bounds like regions, and also that these wells are well separated. So for example, you could have 
a solution, a minimal solution, uh, which is a, a constant false vacuum, a bounce or a multi-bound solution. In these regions, they actually should be almost stationary and they, therefore they should dominate the path integral. Um, now, if you assume that then, uh, then you could say, what if I'm just sort of interested in these regions and uh, I'm gonna draw contours around them, how can I do that? It really doesn't matter how I do that as long as they enclose these, these patches and these patches are well separated. So for example, you could do something like this. So what you want to then, then say is, I, what I want to introduce, instead of a momentum cutoff, instead of a, an expansion in momentum or a position or, or something, what I want to do is like introduce a field space cutoff in the integral. Now, how do you do that? Okay. Um, now I'm going to actually give you uh, a, a flash course in uh, functional normalization. <laughs> So functional normalization uh, normally is actually a really cool, I think, non-perturbative formalism. Uh, and it's actually formally exact. You do have to often make an approximation to solve it, but it is kind of uh, describing the flow of an effective action. And uh, with, in terms of like this regulator function, which uh, regulates both the IR and the UV, as you can see from like here, this kind of term uh, uh, being here in the denominator and in the, numerator. So what happens when I use this formalism? Um, so what I do is effectively, I, I add a term to my effective action. So my effective action is defined as you are used to it being defined, but instead I'm now adding this extra term and this term is uh, quadratic in the field and it has this, uh, this propagator here, or sorry, this, uh, this uh, regulator here. And so if I add this term to the effective action, the effective action gets this uh, K subscript, it becomes uh, K dependent. But I need to define my regulator such that at k equals zero, uh, it goes to zero. And so at k equals zero, everything looks uh, like normal. So then I start at some scale lambda. I will choose a scale. I need to choose a scale such that like everything is not really dependent on the scale. Um, and uh, I, choose, I start at that scale with my theory level uh, action. And then I flow down in k. Uh, and as I, as I lower k, the regular, re regulator keeps track of, for me uh, of the fluctuations and it uh, means, and it makes that the fluctuations are successfully taken to, into account and consistently uh, because the modes below the skill k are heavy and the modes above k fluctuate. And then I had this effect of uh, UV cutoff, as I said. Um, and then I finish at k equals zero with an effective action. Now I do want to remark that k is not a momentum. K is just a bookkeeping device uh, for me, which is like the momentum. So, um, and I also have some choice in what the uh, functional form of R sub k of the regulator that I choose. Um, okay. Then what we are proposing is that I can actually give this regulator another function. And the function that I uh, can give it is, it's already keeping track of fluctuations for me. Now I'm also gonna tell it that uh, I want fluctuations that are, I only want fluctuations that are bounded in field space. And so conditions that you can then impose. So uh, to find a particular regulator that can do that for you, these are the conditions that we impose in our, uh, in the first paper we are working on uh, on different options, but what really what we want to do is like we want to limit the size of fluctuations. And so what I'm uh, what what we're our first proposal is is that like the leading inverse scale of fluctuations around the mean field is given by you know this this uh, uh, functional derivative of the effective action. And so what I'm going to say is I want these fluctuations to be small. And so I'm going to choose my regulator given these two conditions. And so I have a choice in what functional form I use, but uh, what I'm using, and it's particularly easy to work with, is this kind of theta function here and this, uh, you know, this argument here. Um, this is somewhat like the lithium regulators um, that are often used in R4G, except now that there's this uh, field, field dependence here in the regulator. Um, now, the flow equation can be derived from the effective action just by adding this term and taking functional uh, derivatives. Sorry, now, I, I got lost for a second. Is uh -huh. K related to the momenta of these fields or not? And if yes, are you? So K, yeah, so K is, K is related to, so your regulator takes care of the fact that you are taking into account modes with momenta around K. But in the end, mm -hmm. I'm taking K to zero. So I'm taking into account 
all the modes. If that makes oh, sense. Okay, but at fixed k, you are integrating out modes that are above or below k. That or uh, you're you're integrating out modes with with p similar to k. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so, but because k doesn't have a, an actual physical interpretation, and I have some freedom in how I choose the regulator. Um, I think it would be hard to actually formulate a theory such that K is a, keeps track of, you can build your EFC around K. Um, to me, it only makes sense to uh, take K all the way to zero um, so that you uh, are integrate out, uh, all, integrating out all of the, the modes. For me, it's a bookkeeping device, but it, it does ensure that like uh, this, this regulator ensures that you're taking into account momentum, momenta of order K around K. Does that make sense? The moment around K. So this is, I see, okay. That's what the regulator does. Okay, yeah. yeah, thanks. Yeah, I had missed that one line there. Um, cool, yeah. Okay, so what I was saying, so uh, normally you derive a flow equation uh, just by taking this uh, derivative like of the effective action. Um, but in our case, so normally you, you, you just take a derivative of the effective action and you find your propagator. In our case, we have to redo this because now, because our reg regulator now depends on the fields, uh, a lot of these functional derivatives of the regulator, which you normally assume to be zero, are now not zero for us. And so we have to do this again. Um, and um, yeah, I'll spare, I'll, uh, spare you uh, like a whole bunch of... Uh, uh, a whole bunch of like uh, work. It turned out that like, uh, you know, taking functional derivatives is really not my strong suit. So it was a bit of a headache. The thing that you want to compute is that here this like a uh, flow equation with this effective propagator here where, uh, you know, we did this and they, and given the regulator uh, that I just proposed to you, our effective propagator looks like this. And so this is kind of the normal form, but now we have these extra two terms here. So we've got these um, functional derivatives of this functional and this uh, reg regulator term in here. So um, the calculation that we did like so far is exact. This is an exact calculation. It's uh, just a, the flow equation is not uh, using any approximation or coupling expansion or anything like that. In practice to solve it though, you need to, sol you need to use an approximation scheme. And so the approximation scheme that I'm using today is the, uh, the uh, uh, local potential approximation so the first term in the derivative expansion, if you will. And so that's this, you're just, I'm just uh, suppressing terms of uh, higher order momentum here. And uh, all I keep in my effective action is this. And so in this local potential approximation, my flow equation has uh, you know, a simpler form, uh, or you can see if, if you find it simple or not, but it, it looks like this. So um, after a long calculation, like your flow equation looks like this. And so this is the thing that I can use, this is my effective action that I can use. Effective action sub k, and so at a scale k equals lambda, I put in my bare potential, my tree level potential, and then I use this flow equation to flow in k, but this is also, this is the eventual equation. Of course, u sub k depends, this is the potential, so it depends on the field. Uh, but so I flow, uh, you know, towards like this like u sub zero effective potential. And at this scale, I've integrated, in, integrated out uh, all of the fluctuations uh, but not the fluctuations that are non-local in the field. And so um, that's what we did just to test it. Like numerically, you can do this. It's actually numerically pretty, pretty easy to do. So like really uh, just a couple of lines, honestly, in both Mathematic and Python, we did this. Um, and this is, you know, an example of such a, such a calculation. Here is a toy model. I have a real scalar field and a simple potential. And uh, I have the potential that I can manipulate to have a weak coupling or a strong coupling. And so here in this plot, what do you see? You see here, um, the three level potential is here, this orange line. I'll just follow it here with my cursor in case that the colors are not so clear. The dotted line here is the pure FRG. So if I just actually don't modify the, uh, the functional normalization group and do the calculation, I find this convexity back here that I talked about. And then overlapping, you see here the dashed line and the uh, continuous line here. And these are the overlapping one loop calculation and uh, our calculation, which you call uh, QSEA, so uh, quasi static effective action. And so that's kind of, you know, obviously not a proof that this works, but it's, it's uh, reassuring that in the weak coupling limits, we 
uh, we are, you know, we predict something that's similar to uh, the one loop uh, model, which you expect to work in the weak coupling limit. Uh, now here on the right, you see, you know, for stronger coupling, and you see that correspondence is, uh, goes away. So the, the QSA result is here still the continuous line, and the uh, one loop result is here this, uh, this uh, dashed line. Okay. Um, now the decay rate in the theory is, of course, you know, not just given by the effective potential. You actually need to calculate a bounce, and uh, so that's actually not something we did in our first paper, and but something we're working on at the moment. And so, um, you know, the in the exact theory, you don't actually need to call. You know, your prefactor here of this thing is is, is not super. It's actually very very simple. But in an derivative expansion, you need to calculate also uh, the zero modes and the prefactor like gets a Jacobian factor, um, which is kind of similar to a perturbation theory. And so doing this calculation and comparing the results um, is like, you know, uh, is uh, given by, by something like this. So here it is, S4 is actually the thing that goes, so it's the 4, uh, 04 bounds action, and the thing that goes here in the exponential. And you see here that, you know, of course, there's a minus sign and an exponential here. So the, um, the limit, the sort of thin wall limit, if you will, like is here for a very large effective actions. I choose, I have here used the parameter, which I know often uh, characterizes the strength of a, a first order phase transition. And so uh, you see here that these lines tra track each other up until this, this, uh, this uh, late, uh, you know, very large in the parameter. Can I ask you one question? So in the previous uh, slide, you showed the difference between the one loop effective potential versus your computation. And then uh, this one loop means uh, MS bar scheme computation. Yeah, bar scheme. Yeah, and then your computation looks like some mass dependent to regularization. So it's just simply those the difference between mass independent versus mass dependent one, or you are resumming all high orders. So, so if you improve with the effective potential, even in mass independent scheme, you would agree with each other. What's the... I mean, what's the origin of this uh, discrepancy? What's the origin of what discrepancy? Uh, I mean, why do you expect uh, that should be the same at the weak coupling and uh, should it deviate at strong coupling? I just want to understand. Okay, yeah. So like the one loop result here is like just a, a, a couple, an expansion in the coupling in the MS bar scheme. And uh, the QSEA scheme, so this is actually, you're not, I'm not expanding in coupling. So as I was saying, like the flow equation that you derive is actually uh, formally exact, and it's uh, and and later on I do do I do use a derivative expansion, but I'm still not expanding in the coupling. Um, so that's kind of functional renormalization. You know, is a lot older than uh, you know um, the, the year that I've worked on it, uh, but it's often also used for strongly coupled models, for example, and QCD. Sorry. In principle, it should be exact. That's In what you're saying. In principle, it should be exact, and, and uh, it's also used to study D or even gravity. Uh, I mean, I know the gauge, gauge dependence issue for this uh, mass dependence schemes. Yeah. So there is no consistent uh, mass dependence scheme, which is gauge invariant. So always people suffer from this. So you, you cannot use it I for gauge I theories. I burned my hands on gauge. Yeah all yet so I, this was a real scalar field but yeah like uh we are we're we're gonna think about that but yes yeah i don't have a comment about that yet um okay yeah i mean i'm i'm actually almost at the end but as you can like you know this is uh you know we we uh made one proposal and we are uh showed that you know it could be interesting in the context of a real scalar field but a real scalar field uh you know, is not enough to model the physics that we find interesting. And so there's a lot of questions that we have now. Now, uh, one that's almost finished is that uh, it's different like and scalars, anything with gauge fields, if you will, and find a temperature extension of, of this work. Um, and so that should be done fairly soon. Um, but the, and the, like another thing that we're working on is like an actual detailed comparison with uh, momentum coarse graining. And uh, so th some things that are also kind of, you know, in the pipeline in particular is kind of comparison with these, this 2PI formalism. So 2PI formalism is actually quite interesting. Instead of just like sourcing one point functions in your, uh, your effective action, you also have like a two point function as course. And so you have a bit more control 
And uh, it's kind of actually like, you know, the results that you get in this formalism are quite similar to what we uh, are finding. So it's uh, something we're exploring uh, as well at the moment. And then, uh, yeah, gauge fields are, you know, something that's, uh, you know, we, we need a, a strong drink or like some courage for, but we are also going to start that uh, hopefully soon. Uh, one thing that I do want to say is that, like, if you work on something that's like QCD, what you can do is actually, uh, you know, if you uh, estimate the gauge field to be like a background, like in the PQM model, like you have a whole loop background, and that's how you take into account your gauge field, uh, really uh, uh, the same problems. Um, but yeah, if you want a spontaneous breaking of a gauge theory, uh, you better take into account uh, explicit gauge fields. Okay, so um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed my uh, my talk about uh, you know a new way of studying false vacuum decay. Um, I found out some interesting things that I didn't know about field theory, and I think um, this is just one direction in which we're trying to address like actually improving the calculations of um, the uh, false vacuum decay rates and the phenomenology of uh, the gravitational wave phenomenology of uh, first order phase transitions in the early universe. Um, so yeah, if you're very, if you find this interesting and uh, you want to help with this type of calculation, please come and see me, and I'll uh, I'll be happy to take some more questions. Questions? Zoom, maybe as well. Okay, so back to the room. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I do have a couple, well, not really questions, but to make sure that I, I understood. So I missed the step uh, in your derivation where, so at some point you said that you do a derivative expansion. Does it mean that before you find a classical solution and this is an expansion in derivative of the action or that object there or? Yes, yeah, so, so yeah, so what you're just uh, assuming that your your action can be uh, can be put in this form of just having this type, this kinetic term and this, uh, this uh, um, potential term as a function of the fields and you're ignoring, uh, you know, higher order corrections. And in this, this uh, local potential approximation scheme, at the moment, I'm even ignoring um, wave function uh, renormalization. Um, yeah, for, for now. So, yeah. And in the, the phi bar, I mean, the classical solution around which you expand, is it the usual way or? Yeah, so I'm not finding this because I don't actually have to. So like okay. um, the, uh, the regulator term that I'm using takes care of this for me. So I don't have to find uh, an expansion uh, around with, like I don't have to find. Ah, I see, so that's a formal, I see. So phi bar is the object that you want to find by this procedure. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Good, good, yeah. thanks. Okay, that makes it clear at least for me. Any, any more questions?